Think of the planet like a human body that we inhabit. The skeleton is the transportation system of roads and railways, bridges and tunnels, air and seaports that enable our mobility across the continents. The vascular system that powers the body, or the oil and gas pipelines and electricity grids that distribute energy, and the nervous system of communications. Is the internet cables, satellites, cellular networks, and data centers that allow us to share information? This ever-expanding infrastructural matrix already consists of 64 million kilometers of roads, 4 million kilometers of railways, 2 million kilometers of pipelines, and 1 million kilometers of internet cables. What about international borders? We have less than 500,000 kilometers of borders. Let's build a better map of the world, and we can start by overcoming some ancient mythology. There's a saying with which all students of history are familiar: "Geography is destiny." Sounds so grave, doesn't it? It's such a fatalistic adage. It tells us that landlocked countries are condemned to be poor. That small countries cannot escape their larger neighbors, that vast distances are insurmountable. But every journey I take around the world, I see an even greater force sweeping the planet: connectivity. The global connectivity revolution, in all of its forms—transportation, energy, and communications—has enabled such a quantum leap in the mobility of people. Of goods, of resources, of knowledge, such that we can no longer even think of geography as distinct from it. In fact, I view the two forces as fusing together into what I call connectography. Connectography represents a quantum leap in the mobility of people, resources, ideas, but it is an evolution, an evolution of the world from. Political geography, which is how we legally divide the world, to functional geography, which is how we actually use the world, from nations and borders to infrastructure and supply chains. Our global system is evolving from the vertically integrated empires of the 19th century, through the horizontally interdependent nations of the 20th century, into a global. Network civilization in the 21st century, connectivity, not sovereignty, has become the organizing principle of the human species. We are becoming this global network civilization because we are literally building it. All of the world's defense budgets and military spending taken together total just under two trillion dollars per year. Meanwhile, our global infrastructure spending is projected to rise to nine trillion dollars per year within the coming decade, and well, it should. We have been living off an infrastructure stock meant for a world population of three billion, as our population has crossed seven billion to eight billion, and eventually nine billion and more. As a rule of thumb, we should spend about one trillion dollars. On the basic infrastructure needs of every billion people in the world, one billion people in the world today do not have access to all-season roads. One billion people, one seventh of the Earth's population, are totally cut off for some part of the year. We cannot get medicine to them reliably. They cannot get critical supplies, and they cannot get their goods to market in order to create a sustainable income. In Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, 85% of roads are unusable in the wet season. Investments are being made, but at the current level, it's estimated it's going to take them 50 years to catch up. In the U.S. alone, there is more than 4 million miles of roads, very expensive to build, very expensive to maintain infrastructure, with huge ecological footprint, and yet very often congested. Living in Africa is to be on the edge, metaphorically and quite literally, when you think about connectivity before 2008. There were many human, intellectual, and technological leaps that happened in Europe and the rest of the world, but Africa was sort of cut off. 
And that changed, first with ships, when we had the Renaissance, uh, the scientific revolution, and also the industrial revolution. And now we've got the digital revolution. These revolutions have not been evenly distributed across continents and nations, never have been. Now, this is a map of the undersea fiber optic cables that connect Africa to the rest of the world. What I find amazing is that Africa is transcending its geography problem. Africa is connecting to the rest of the world and within itself. The connectivity situation has improved greatly, but some barriers remain. Einstein said, I never think about the future. It comes soon enough. And he was right, of course. So today, I'm here to ask you to think of how the future is happening now. Over the past 200 years, the world has experienced two major waves of innovation. First, the Industrial Revolution brought us machines and factories, railways, electricity, air travel, and our lives have never been the same. Then, the Internet Revolution brought us computing power, data networks, unprecedented access to information and communication. And our lives have never been the same. Now we are experiencing another metamorphic change, the industrial internet. It brings together intelligent machines, advanced analytics, and the creativity of people at work. It's the marriage of minds and machines. And our lives will never be the same. I'm going to talk about Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution. First of all, what is Industry 4.0? It's smart factories instead of factories with chimneys, driven and organized by smart logistics, smart mobility, smart buildings, smart grids, and smart products. So it's not anymore the factory which is in the focus. It's the information technology which is driving Industry 4.0 and then the knowledge of people who create this information technology. So it's more about people, Industry 4.0, than about factories. I said in the beginning I talk about industrialization, and there are two ways of industrialization, and the one is focus on innovation systems. Why? I give you a quote which creates a kind of a picture, hopefully. Just over 100 years ago, Scientific American reported that economic progress in Manhattan was near an end. Why? Because the island could support only a limited number of horses. In the long run, economic growth comes not from cramming more horses or more tourists onto your islands or more factories into your rust belt or even more information onto your service, but from technological breakthroughs. Not from more of the same, but from the new and the previously unthinkable. And what is telling you this picture? It tells you, you cannot plan the next industrial product which you can produce, but you can increase the probability that it will happen in your country when you create an innovation system which works. And what is that? What is an innovation system? What is an upfront innovation system? It's nothing less than creating a full innovation chain. We heard before from Michalis, uh, about the basic research, I don't have to tell you anymore. It's just the abstract way of excellent research. But you need to connect this. You need to connect this with applied research in, done in the very same area, creating invention out of these abstract ideas, getting it closer to innovation. And if you, if you have this area of basic and applied research really in the same location, what you will see, and if you allow them to do so, what you will see is you will see Startups will show up and grab these ideas and make money out of it, creating new products. And as venture capital likes this chain, they also will show up. And now comes something which is really important. You need a bureaucracy which is helpful, which supports startups by, for instance, protecting their ideas, which gives venture capital something like a safe investment environment. And if they do so, you will see some of these New startups will become the future industry. They will grow tremendously, like gazelles. Not many, maybe two out of 100, but that is fine. What you also need is, however, you need 
exchange between all these areas. You need exchange between the area of research and the, exchange and the area of business. You need corporations, networks. You need people talking to each other, cooperating with each other and doing something together out of it. And what you least, last but not least, if you want to fulfill all parts of this innovation chain, because entrepreneurs are not always the best managers, you need a trained management who is able to put m new products into markets.